thank you all, everybody, so much for coming this evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this wonderful public launch of uh, Roberta Gratz's new book. And it is How the People of New Orleans Built, Rebuilt Their City, We're Still Here, You Bastards, by Roberta Brandis Gratz. Uh, on behalf of the New School and Nation Books, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to say a couple of things about some people who have helped make this series uh, possible. Um, they are Mary Watson and Pamela Tillis from the Executive Dean's Office at the New School. And they are our wonderful partners in all the series of events we drew throughout the year. Year. And I also want to thank C-SPAN, and it's so great that you're here tonight filming this and the C-SPAN audience, so thank you. Um, it is such a pleasure to get to publicly uh, introduce Roberta Gratz, someone who has been a hero of mine for a long time, way before I came to the Nation Institute. Um, she is an amazing writer uh, and thinker. She's an acclaimed urbanist, and she's published four previous books, including most recently The Battle for Gotham, New York in the Shadow of Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs. Her writing has also appeared in The Nation, The New York Times Magazine, and The Wall Street Journal. And as many of you know, she previously served on New York City's Landmarks Preservation Committee and New York's Sustainability Advisory Board. And with Jane Jacobs, she founded the Center for City Living. And as many of you now know, she splits her time between New York and New Orleans. So Roberta, thank you, and enjoy the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Taya, and thank you to the Nation Institute for uh, sponsoring this evening. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, my friends and colleagues, and then Jed is going to lead us in conversation. We lost John Barrett for the evening uh, for a very good reason, uh, having to do with his own book. So we excused him, and we said, We'll manage to self-organize, so um, we have. And uh, we expect it to be a lively conversation, and at some point, Jed will uh, open up for questions from the audience, and there will be cards passed around uh, for you to put questions and uh, pose them to us. So I'm gonna start um, on my right uh, with Jed Horn, uh, who I've told everybody, uh, I felt after Katrina, he wrote probably the best post-Katrina book called Breach of Faith. Um, Until now, the best, yes. Uh. <laughs> um, and he became a good friend, source, and even an editorial critic of mine over the years. He was on uh, city editor and metro editor at the Times-Picayune at the time of the Pulitzer winning coverage of Katrina. Uh, and then, of course, you know, um, uh, Breach of Faith. Then we have, uh, to my right, Karen Gadbois, who when, if and when you read the book, you will see is one of the heroines of the book. Um, Karen, I like to describe as the civic activist who became a civic activist the usual way. She got angry. And she started a blog right after Katrina um, called Squandered Heritage, uh, tracking the houses that were demolished without the owners knowing, uh, the contractors uh, uh, taking money for work they weren't doing, and leading uh, what it turned into a uh, revealing the uh, uh, corruption in the blight removal system, and people actually went to jail leading eventually to her and a colleague starting The Lens, which is an online investigative journal, which I consider one of the best things that happened in New Orleans after Katrina. It is just fabulous. And um, she continues uh, to write and make trouble uh, in the way that I think is, is works. To my left is uh, Lois Eli, and for those of you who followed the HBO Treme series. Uh, Lolas was story editor and writer on that series. And if you may have seen, and if you haven't, and it's av uh, available online, um, he produced a wonderful, um, I guess it's a video, uh, uh, called Faubourg Treme, The Hidden Story 
the unknown story of uh, black New Orleans, and it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, and then further to my left is Randy Fertel, um, who among many things um, runs the Ruth Fertel Foundation devoted to education and New Orleans, and himself an author of uh, a recent wonderful book called Taste for Chaos, uh, which is basically um, uh, l about literary improvisation and many other things, and also wrote a, f a book prior to that about his own crazy family story. His mother was Ruth Chris Restaurant, and his father was, I won't even tell you, but uh, it's, <laughs> it's a good book. Um, so. Uh, I, I have one little thing to tell you, just uh, to answer the curiosity of some. The title of the book was a real graffiti after Katrina, not the one on the uh, cover of the book. The art department took it and redid it. But it was a real graffiti, and the reality was such that we used it as the title because it really was, captures the, the feeling of so many New Orleanians uh, since the whole world was really, uh, you know, assuming either it shouldn't be rebuilt or won't be rebuilt, won't recover, all the experts saying all those things, and the people of New Orleans just said, we're still here, you bastards, we ain't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. So that's the overall spirit of the book, um, but I wanted you to know that that's uh, where, it com where it comes from. At this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Jed to sort of um, lead this little pack of talkers uh, into some organized system. Um, three items of business to start with. I haven't heard a cell phone, which suggests that you all are accustomed to turning your cell phones off and have already done so. Um, secondly, to reiterate something that I think um, Roberta already said, if we say something totally uh, obnoxious or stupid, feel free to rise in righteous indignation and quiz us here and now. But for the most part, I think we'll be better off if the questions um, can be held to the end. And, and I think you're asked to write down your answers and submit them somewhere. Um, thirdly, um, for close scholars of the, uh, of the disaster, you'll hear us using Katrina and federal flood and levee collapse kind of interchangeably. We do so fully cognizant that Katrina, as we speak of it in New Orleans, was a man-made disaster. It was, in fact, an engineering failure. The levee system collapsed in the face of a relatively minor storm by the time it actually reached New Orleans. Um, it is, in fact, uh, the second worst engineering failure in human history. Does anybody know what the worst engineering failure in human history was? Scholars in our midst? Chernobyl. Chernobyl was worse, and, and maybe Maybe Fukushima is going to get there. We have to hope not. I, I was just over there doing a yeah. documentary for NHK TV, the Japanese PBS, and it's a rather horrifyingly st still ambiguous situation as to whether they've rained that thing to the ground. Um, enough business. Roberta, extraordinary stories, beautifully told. The question that I think haunts a lot of, uh, of Katrina discussion is whether it takes a Katrina to have provoked the kind of urbanist issues that you've dealt with so succinctly and beautifully in the book, which everybody's about to go by. Does it take a Katrina? Are there lessons here, broader themes that apply to cities everywhere, or is this just New Orleans being its eccentric and peculiar self? Um, can you make it a little louder? Uh, is this better? Yeah. yeah. OK. Sorry, right. we'll try. Um, there's uh, two ways to answer that, because um, I should uh, preface it by saying this is my fifth book about urban change. I have been writing about how cities grow, fall apart, recover, um, how they stay urban um, for a long time. And uh, when I watched Katrina on television, I said to myself, how is this going to play out? There are two ways to go. Um, was this going to be another one of those um, post 
disaster attempts uh, to reshape the city uh, in a sort of Robert Moses image from the top down, um, big project planning, big money, or was this going to emerge in the um, way that I have seen every success in every city, in every neighborhood that has succeeded, they have succeeded from the ground up with citizen-led, uh, citizen initiatives. Which way was this gonna go? So my immediate uh, feeling was I have to get down there. Um, I did three weeks after the storm, did my first story going into the Lower Ninth Ward with a gentleman who could only get in there with my press credentials because the, the Lower Ninth Ward was not reopened. The last neighborhood allowed back in the, in the city four months after and long after the water had receded. And he walked in and he looked around. I have to tell you, if it had been me, I would have turned around and never looked back. It was as everything you can imagine. And he looked and he said, it was in bad shape when I bought it. I fixed it once, I'll do it again. I was so inspired um, and I felt if this was the spirit I was gonna see in New Orleans, this was a story I had to tell and I continued to go, and that was the spirit that I did find in New Orleans. So as far as other cities, this story has every tale, good and bad, that every other city has. It has the tragedies, the, uh, the disaster capitalism stories, the demolitions that should never have happened, the charity hosp hospital story is as bad a urban uh, destruction story as I have ever seen. Um, and it has all the good stuff where local wisdom trumped uh, distant expertise. Um, so there, yes, there are a lot of lessons. What I'd never expected in New Orleans, uh, even though I had been there, I had written a little bit about it, but New Orleans is so much more urban than the world thinks. And they're deceived because the housing that you see is mostly uh, two, three-story uh, historic housing. It is urban in ways which I won't go into here, but I do um, outline in the book. And uh, the lesson, it's urbanism, is a lesson to the cities around the country that are struggling to get back their urbanism, having been decimated by so many clearance and big top-down projects. Um, the, the lesson of urbanism is definitely in New Orleans. So yes, it is both. Um, and I think, uh, I hope this book is read not just as a specific story, but as one with lessons also how to deal with di disaster. And uh, you know we can discuss some of those issues. But it's both uh, the story of where we are and why with our cities and where we should be going um, if we're gonna recover from whether it was an urban renewal disaster or a natural disaster or a man-made disaster. Lois, I'm gonna rope you into this conversation if I may. I'm remembering, and of course this 10th anniversary year is full of memories of some of the, the noise that we put ourselves through and the agony and the misery. After all, 1,500 people had died, but we had to look ahead and Begin, begin thinking about the rebuilding. And in the early going, there was enormous anxiety about um, whether the city would lose its cultural panache, whether, whether we would be disnified beyond recognition, that we would become a little toy version of what we had been, which is a richly Afro-Caribbean culture, a majority black population. Um, there certainly has been ominously large onslaughts of gentrification, but how fares the culture? How have we done? Is it still a city with its own claim on cultural originality and vigor? Well, at the time of the flood, I was a newspaper columnist being edited by one Jed Horn. <laughs> and I tried to call all the smart people I knew, including a man named David Kallick from the Fiscal Policy Institute who's here this evening. And he put me in touch with a bunch of experts who said, after all these big disasters, and he's gone back like, you know, to the, the 
Lisbon earthquake of 14 something or other. Like, people always talk about how they're going to do all these things very differently and they're going to make sense out of the imperfections that preceded the disaster. But in the end, they pretty much go back to what it was before. In the context of New Orleans culture, little could be better than going back to the way it was before. What's striking is that um, I had kind of tired of carnival and it had gotten to be sort of blasé for me and I, I just had lost interest in it. But the Mardi Gras after the flood, you found people coming back to the city with a kind of feeling and a kind of dedication, a kind of determination that I'd certainly never seen in carnival and probably hadn't seen any other context either. There was a sense that we had almost lost those things which we held most dear. And it seemed as if there was, there's been an attempt to reclaim the culture with a vengeance of sorts. Sweet Home New Orleans did an informal survey of culture bearers after the flood. And what they concluded was that more people were masking among the Mardi Gras Indians, more people working in the social aid and pleasure clubs than ever before. But of course, to understand that, you have to put this in a kind of historical context. Um, when we talk about the disasters that have hit New Orleans, one of them certainly, in a, in a way, was the American Purchase. Because the Americans attempted to impose a kind of American racism on a sort of Creole detente that existed before, which while racist and imperfect, was nonetheless not nearly as bad as Alabama and Mississippi, and for that matter, New York and Pennsylvania. <laughs> then we had, of course, Plessy versus Ferguson, the civil rights case that we tend to want to forget. And in addition, New Orleans has been at war with its culture for the entirety of its existence. Governor Miro, back in, I believe, the 1780s, made it illegal for black people to mask as Indians on Carnival Day, which is to say that the Mardi Gras Indians go back to the 1700s, and the disdain, the official disdain of the Mardi Gras Indians goes back to the 1700s. Then Ray Nagin decides that he wants to charge the social aid and pleasure clubs about 10 times the amount of money that they were charging the richest people in New Orleans to have their carnival parades for them to parade on the streets. Let me repeat this. He wants to charge the poorest people 10 times as much as he wants to charge the richest people. Moving forward to our current mayor who arrests young musicians playing on the streets of New Orleans. He doesn't give them a citation, doesn't give them a warning. He arrests them and takes them to jail. Which is to say that the culture of New Orleans has been in a defensive war against the city of New Orleans for the entirety of black presence in the city. And the war continues much apace and sometimes we win. I don't, I, I don't agree with you that um, Miro uh, made it illegal to mask as Indian. They made it, he made it illegal to mask, for black people to mask during mo Carnival. The, the Indians emerged after, in the, in the 1880s, after the, um, after the Wild, Bill. Wild Bill, yeah, yeah. I think they need to go back further than Wild Bill's Wild West show. Another For those who, who aren't familiar with how this... Mardi Gras Indians emerged when black slaves would run away and go to live with the Indians. The Rooms, and yeah. there they combined their cultures, the African culture with the indigenous culture of America. That's well, where Mardi Gras Indians come from. I think certainly the, the tradition that we speak of as Mardi Gras Indian is an homage to that relationship, but I don't think it's exactly the same thing as... As the, for those, for, let, me just, let me just say, for those who are not, who want a footnote here, the, um, the, the upshot of the Indian uh, suppression, if you will, the masking and all of that, was a wonderfully satirical counterthrust by black New Orleans. They proceeded to put on blackface over black skin and wear fright wigs and grass skirts and basically make themselves a parody of the stereotypical image that the whites had of, of uh, black people and of Indians both. And to this day, they parade rather brilliantly uh, through the streets of New Orleans, sometimes with Louis Armstrong as the king back in, what, 48 or something like that. Anyway, we can come back to, to the Indians if people are as fascinated with them as I am and, and Lola's is. Um, on another theme altogether, um, New Orleans has been called the northernmost banana republic. It has also, and I think with equal uh, relevance, been called the southernmost uh, part of the Rust Belt. 
So you can liken us to Tegucigalpa, if you will, or to Detroit, which is ma maybe the more immediate and or current analogy. And, and the westernmost Mediterranean. Uh huh. That's yes, right. We do have our share of. And and one of my favorite jokes about New Orleans is that you have to go north of I-10 to get to the south. That's right. Miss Mississippi is deeply southern, and and New Orleans is a Caribbean port. It's uh, it's it's very different. Um, all of which is by way of prologue to say that New Orleans had been hugely blighted in its Detroit mode, well before Katrina and the the, the levee collapse. Um, that was certainly not uh, alleviated uh, one bit by 230,000 housing units being destroyed uh, in the flood. We have in our midst a very close scholar of blight and of the particularities of blight in New Orleans. And I just thought Karen could bring us up to speed on that whole part of the Katrina recovery. Well, I mean, I think it's interesting that <clears throat> the architecture of New Orleans is often uh, referenced apart from the culture of New Orleans, when actually the culture of New Orleans is embodied in its housing, which many of our uh, craftsmen were also musicians, et cetera, et cetera. So even though they're well intertwined, there seems to be general ignorance about the fact that <clears throat> this is the physical embodiment that endured for 100 plus years, and a little water was not going to uh, wash them away, but what uh, the broken levees didn't accomplish some boneheaded public policy and a few bucks from the federal government really um, pushed along. I did spend a lot of time documenting um, demolitions which were done against homeowners' wishes, but I also cataloged thousands of homes that <clears throat> people who had already disinvested in the city um, in the sort of white flight era um, and had no homeowners insurance and had no intention in, in returning those properties to commerce, had opted to take a few bucks from the federal government to demolish. Um, I just started actually going through that catalog of photos and what I'm finding is about a 90% um, vacant lot uh, result from that <clears throat> loss. Um, so I, I did spend a lot of time looking at blight and blight is a very uh, fun word to play around with because you can use it as a as an excuse for just about anything, and it often does get used. Um, I know there's one person in the audience, Brad Vogel, who was kind of picked up where I left off, and he cataloged a lot of properties that had been slated for demolition in the footprint of these massive hospital complexes, which were also the sort of disaster capitalism uh, post-Katrina, where neighborhoods were taken out for um, hospitals, which are still not functioning. Uh, but my... Uh, interest in cataloging the demolition of New Orleans was that we were at the beginning, and even you said it's, it gets said over and over again that 80% of the city was destroyed, 80% was not destroyed, 80% of the city was damaged. Some of that damage was horrific and, and resulted in homes being lost, but for the most part, the houses are built um, with materials that could take the water, and if we were educated about how to mitigate that water damage, we would have seen a lot less loss than we've seen. Um, that answered your question. Uh, it does. It <laughs> answers it nicely. Um, I oh, also, one more thing is that money that came from the federal government to demolish it could not be used to demolish pre-Katrina blight. So all the blight that had existed before the, the uh, flood continued to, to flourish. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to leave the details to to Roberta's book because they are delicious. But I want you all, when you read that book, to pay attention to Karen's um, sudden, shall we say, advent as a uh, as a scourge of the city and as a journalist because she was doing something quite different before that. And it's a wonderful testament to the power of citizens to rise up and and make things happen in the aftermath of disaster. Um, there were a lot of big ideas floating around right after Katrina. Um, you know, we were going to run a, a high-speed rail from Biloxi to Baton Rouge. We were going to put casinos all over the downtown area. We were going to put health clinics in every neighborhood, uh, kind of in coordination with, uh, you know, uh, uh, what we hoped would become a, ref a, a health reform. 
Um, the one thing that certifiably did happen, and it was not, unfortunately, a fully uh, robust levy system, was a enormous shakeup of the school system in New Orleans. Very controversial. Um, we now have 95% of kids going to charter schools. Um, in some respects, strikingly successful. Um, but I'll leave it at that and ask Randy, who knows much more about it than the rest of us, to, to comment on where we're at uh, in New Orleans. What happened, who won, who lost, and uh, what's going on with the schools? Well, it is a very, it is a very complicated story, and um, a charter school movement in America is, is very controversial. Uh, in New Orleans, there's some terrific charter schools. Um, the, they, they emerged, uh, the, the, the school board was um, utterly, uh, can I say corrupt? Why not? And, and, uh, and uh, bankrupt uh, right before Katrina. And uh, there are statistics that show that things were improving a bit um, as 2005 um, came our way. But um, after Katrina, there was this um, movement to start charter schools. That I, I had been supporting a charter school uh, that I think emerged in the 90s. Um, and uh, right after Katrina, I was at a nation dinner and met Alice Waters. And uh, she told me this wonderful story about how Chef Paul Prudhomme had saved her career, and she wanted to do something for New Orleans. And I said, well, I support a school with a garden. Would you like to bring the edible schoolyard to New Orleans? And she jumped at it. So uh, that was in December, I guess, Hantea. And uh, um, by April, Alice was in New Orleans. And by September, we had an edible schoolyard, uh, her wonderful program in Berkeley where, where um, kids learn to garden sustainably and eat sustainably and uh, understand where their food comes from. And, and, and if they grow it, they'll eat it. So they learn how to eat good food. Um, so now we have five of these schools in First Line uh, Schools, which is one of the, the better charter school groups. And um, one of the interesting things about this was that um, First Line was one of the first schools that reopened after Katrina in January. and. Their focus on the edible schoolyard taught the rest of New Orleans schools that by focusing on something that created a marketability. Because one of the things that happened was the, um, it was decided that students could go to any school in New Orleans. They didn't have to be neighborhood bound. There would be busing from anywhere and to, to anywhere. Um, and so schools started competing. And one of the things they competed on is focus. One school is math sciences. One school is uh, this or that. And, and the edible schoolyard kind of, I've, I've, been, I've heard, has helped shape that. Now, the busing thing, I think, is one of our ongoing problems, because they're spending a lot of money uh, on, on busing. And the students are spending a lot of time on buses. Um, and the neighborhoods, I think, are, are, the, are the losers, uh, because I think there's benefits in, in schools. You know, I, one of our fifth edible schoolyard is at the elementary school where I went, and it was half a block from where I live. So um, I feel strongly about that. Um, so, I'm a, you know, I, I'm not a fan of all the charter schools, but I'm a fan of many, and I'm supporting them. And uh, it's, I, th I think, I'm not sure it's comparable to the rest of America and the charter school movement. It's, yeah, I think it's working very well in New Orleans in general. Yeah, I don't, I don't think any city has made as complete a commitment to charter schools as elsewhere um, with our 95 percent. Uh, um, say something? I want to add something to this, <clears throat> and I have a whole chapter in the book on the education. Um, it's the one chapter in which I'm equivocal. And those of you who know me, I'm not usually equivocal. Um, because it's there's good news and there's bad news. Um, the really, the, there, there's, you know, the old school system was decidedly corrupt. Um, and one could... Uh, one really has to fairly look at the 
uh, how that evolution occurred. When, and let's get to the bottom of it starting when the schools turned from white to black in the 60s with white flight and budgets were cut and programs were cut and everything deteriorated to the point that there's no doubt when Katrina came, the schools were a joke some of them didn't even have toilet paper in the bathrooms. However, um, what's happening now, and I haven't looked totally into this yet, but I'm seeing pieces of it. You have state money from the Recovery School District rebuilding some fabulous school buildings, all of which were allowed to deteriorate, never had anything done to them, probably since the 60s and 70s. So public money is restoring these schools they are then being sold or turned over to charter schools that are not fully public. Um, there, are, there, are, there are all these little elements that are uh, sometimes lost in the picture. In the beginning, a lot of the charter schools, they swept everything clean. And among the things they eliminated without understanding the culture was the ba a lot of the schools eliminated bands. And the bands define the neighborhoods and the schools, and it's coming back. And Randy is supportive of of a program that's helping put music back in the, Art, in the artist core. Of uh, the artist core, putting it back in the school system. But what's happened over the ten years? Because I started out more negative than I than I ended up, was that at least the charter schools are listening to the criticism and uh, making adjustments, some of them are, uh, and some of them are failing and closing. Um, and it's a very hard system to get a picture of because it's not centralized, it's not easy to, it, it, you, to get a, f a really full picture. So from a national perspective, I think it makes an interesting study of the evolution of what's happening in the charter system. And it's only because of Katrina that they could sweep it clean the way they have. Uh, so I, in that way, it doesn't really compare with other systems, but it is being watched for reasons that um, you know, are evolving. Um, I will see your negative and go several negatives more. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing that these people did to remake the school system was fire all the teachers. I cannot understand how you can care about the kids and fire all of their mothers, aunts, and the occasional uncle and father who are teaching in the schools. Now, if you could convince me that you then replace these with competent, experienced teachers, I might go for that, because without a doubt, many of the teachers were incompetent, not all of them. To prove that they weren't all incompetent, after this new school system, and I use the word system in the loosest possible sense, after this new system was serving kids frozen sandwiches and the like, and it sometimes seemed to be far more concerned about security than they were about education, they then began to hire some of the people back whom they had fired. The other thing you've got to be very careful about in terms of this is what everyone wants, what all the politicians really want to do is pronounce post-flood New Orleans a success. And so anytime the charter schools give out some statistics about how well they're doing, that's trumpeted. There's a group called Research on Reforms with um, Renard Sanders and Barbara Ferguson. And they study all these pronouncements that the charter schools make. And they find a whole lot of holes in these pronouncements. And without going into the detail, it's not clear that the charter schools have been nearly as good as they're supposed to have been. One other interesting fact, before the flood, there was a threshold when a school fell beneath that threshold, the state was allowed to take it over. After the flood, they decided to make it easier for the state to take over more schools. I begin to wonder whether that any of this was about a public school system and about educating kids, and whether it was about the privatization of public resources, not unlike what you're saying about them using public money to refurbish the school system and then give it to a private organization, at times profit or for-profit organizations, to run the school system. I'm just not, I think we're rushing to pronounce uh, success, yeah. I, g I have to jump in, and the devil is always in the details, and the nuances are what is so fascinating <clears throat> about the Katrina story and, and Roberta's ability to understand those nuances and frame them in ways that are communicable and um, analytically shrewd. 
Um, it's worth remembering, and I'll just make this observation, that the school teachers were fired, a horrible event, that is exactly symptomatic of what was wrong with the old system. The people who fired the teachers in New Orleans were not the takeover guys coming down from Baton Rouge, hell-bent to charter the whole world. It was the Orleans Parish School Board, which had lost $80 million, whose president was on her way to prison, and which had developed a system in which a 30% illiteracy rate was noted among graduating seniors in which a valedictorian at one of the schools had failed the exit exam five times. And this same school board had proposed to shut down the entire system for a full year, at which point the, the charter crowd, the, the, the people up in Baton Rouge, came rushing in and said, and, and Scott Cowan, who was the head of Tulane at the time and very active in the school uh, and recovery movement generally, said, if you do that, we don't have a shot at recovery. There will be no recovery. Nobody can come back if there are no schools for their kids. And so a deadline was imposed on the Orleans Parish School Board to start schools again. And yes, many of the results remain, you know, the, the fact is the uh, graduation rate has gone up nicely. 54% used to graduate. Now it's up, what was it, this past year, 73%. That's not bad uh, getting into college, in fact, many of them. Uh, Two-thirds of the schools were in failure before Katrina. Now I think two-thirds of them by perhaps, you know, there's some wiggle room in how you evaluate failure and success, but now two-thirds of them meet minimum state standards. The district has risen from being the second worst in the state to being, I think it's like 49th out of 68. These are big gains over a decade. And it remains to be seen whether this is sustainable. Uh, whether the, the youngsters that were brought down Teach for America and so forth, whether the burnout ratios will be so high that this just can't be kept up after New Orleans loses its luster and the, 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 the young and the restless move on to whatever comes next. But I mention all of this not to refute what Lolas is saying, but to add that level of complexity that makes the New Orleans situation um, to me so very fascinating. I want to turn back to Roberta, who has... Um, I've got that number somewhere here. It's uh, 45,000 kids. What are the demographics? How many are black? How many are white? How many are white? Um, it's, it's about 90% black, I think. It, oh, it, it's a black city. Um, the interesting thing is that the school system, for all its gains or lack thereof, um, is actually educating a more challenging population because there's more kids who qualify for, what do they call it, reduced lunch, uh, free, or free or reduced lunch, which is a measure of poverty. And in New Orleans, alas, uh, poverty is a, a big, big factor. Also, it's not an easy, uh, you can't look at the New Orleans school system the way you would look at any other city because one of the things that New Orleans has bigger than any other city is a parochial school system as well. So it's, it's got parallel uh, things. And it's very complicated, which is why I say, you know, it, it was nuanced and even for me in the book. But I also think it's important to put it in the largest perspective is to understand that what has been described here as having happened could not have happened without a disaster because politically it was an untenable situation. So for those of you who know Naomi Klein's disaster capitalism, this is the next chapter. It happened in the school system, it happened with the hospital, a terrible story, the worst uh, urban renewal demolition story as I mentioned earlier in the country that I have seen, still a disaster. 10 years later, this over, over expensive new system can't even open because there's not enough money. And the neighborhood was destroyed, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got schools, you've got the hospital, the public housing, big story in my book. What has happened with the public ha housing, whether you agree or not, could not have happened without 
Katrina. The transit system was turned over to a private company. Viola, French company, now runs the public transit system in New Orleans, and it's not better. Where cities across the country are improving their transit system, New Orleans is going backwards because they're more interested in the transit for the tourists than for the resident neighborhoods. Maybe we should bring back Jimmy Reese. <laughs> oh, oh. Jimmy Reese is the one notorious who figure highly quoted as saying let's see if we he can he was the head, of the, was the head of the, the regional transit authority and said um, who, help me remember the good well point. you know we have a wonderful opportunity here to clean up the city we just need to get rid of the poor people right and then he also said and we have to change ge ge uh, geographically demographically in every which way otherwise we're not coming back he, he 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 had some Israeli commandos Which land their helicopter in Audubon Park because he lived across the street and he wanted his house protected. Right. So the point I, I try to put this in perspective. Um, one, th these conference, these differences on th the separate issues is a constant conversation in New Orleans. And for those of you in the audience who might be writers, you can imagine it made me dizzy at times. You know, I'd interview one one uh, morning and someone else in the afternoon, and I'd get opposite stories, and they both seemed valid. So it's very hard to sort out the details, but the largest picture, and this is the national story that really bugs me because this is disaster capitalism. The worst story of, of Katrina, and I go into this in the book as much as I could find, this was about contracts. It was all about contracts. The money coming from Washington was going to the political cronies then of the Bush administration, a few cronies of the Democratic governor, Blanco, um, not from New Orleans, not from even Louisiana, from all over the country. And I'll give you one um, description, and then Jed, you had the other one you had to explain at lunch. The, everybody saw the blue tarps going on rooftops to protect from the, 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 uh, the rain. A square of tarp, uh, $175 charged by a company Shaw Group, $175 a square. They had no expertise in putting and doing anything with roofs, so they con subcontracted to the next people for, I don't even remember, $150. No expertise contracted to the next people, $75. Fourth contract to the guy on the ground who put the tarp on the roof two dollars okay that's where your money went that's where the money went um i make a projection in the book and i'm open for anybody to challenge me they just have to do the study i argue that if they were lucky 20 percent of the money from the federal government that allegedly went to the recovery of new orleans 20 percent is a generous maybe hit New Orleans. Jed, what was the, it, what you had Oh, it's, it's analogous to what Roberta just said. In the case of, of the debris removal, which was of course a gigantic problem as the whole city had been brought to its knees, the Halliburton, let's think now, Dick Cheney was uh, the vice president at the time, and uh, Halliburton was landing these huge contracts. Shaw, which is a kind of a Halliburton, a JV Halliburton based out of Baton Rouge. JV. <laughs> right, very similar. Um, they were getting, let me think if I, if I can do the numbers right, they were collecting 23 bucks per cubic yard of debris, subbing it, just as, as Roberta has described, with the blue roof tarp jobs through various buddies and cronies and so on who had absolutely no hands-on ability or or even any you know contact with the debris and it was hitting the streets where the the local guys with bobcats when they were even local because some of them had to come in from elsewhere were getting three dollars 
a cubic yard. So essentially 20 bucks out of $23 just going to, you know, uh, just being skimmed effectively. But um, And this is also happening statewide. Um, the governor, Jindal, uh, uh, I mean, the words cannot describe. <laughs> um, but he keeps giving out contracts. And for those of us who followed the charity hospital disaster, he kept giving out and has these days in terms of uh, the medical system in the state, he keeps giving out contracts all over the country because he's, he's basically putting money where he's looking for national support as he runs for office. So this is the kind of thing that um, really, I, it's like an alert, alert. Um, I don't know what the comparables are in New York post Sandy, but the thing that nobody realizes is FEMA is not a government agency. It's a government agency contracted out. There's no such thing as public, the, the, the government doesn't exist. Government is all contracts. I often wonder if the Republicans in Congress who talk about cutting the pork are ready to cut the contracts. When Ed Snowden was um, uh, discovered to have done what he did with NSA, and everybody was appalled. He worked for a private contractor. The na nation's hi highest secrets were in the hands of a private contractor. Um, so we have to be careful when we look at what we call government incompetence, because it's more often than not the incompetence of a private contractor that was supposed to improve <coughs> on the public uh, process and supposedly save money, and it does the opposite. W what you're talking about, though, is not the problem of government, but the problem of a government that hasn't believed in governing. Since Reagan, you Good know, point. the problem is uh, government, not. And um, John Pope, your former colleague at the Times Picayune, uh, was interviewing uh, Jimmy Carter at the Ridenauer Prizes in 2007. And uh, he threw him a lob and said, so, so what do you think about the FEMA's, uh, FEMA's uh, uh, work a after Katrina? And uh, Carter kind of smiled and said, well, you know, no one realizes it, but I created FEMA. Uh, when I came into office, there were 23 agencies that were, you know, not working together, and, and we studied it, and we decided to have one agency, and we decided there would be three rules. One, they would be well-funded. We know how that worked out in the 90s and aughts. Uh, the, um, the, pr the head of FEMA would be an expert in emergency management. We know how that worked out, uh, Brownie. And, uh, and three, uh, that CEO of FEMA would report directly to the president, uh, and we know how that worked out because now he uh, uh, reports to emer uh, to uh, Homeland, Security. Home Homeland Security. Thanks. So uh, he and so he said, well, so I don't think they did real well after Katrina. Um, so it's it's a, not about government. It's you know we need to get back in trusting that government has a role to perform, even if we believe that all the good stuff comes up from the bottom. Still, when government is doing its business, it needs to do its business. Randy, how are we ever going to trust the government as long as Bobby Jindal is the governor of the state of Louisiana? I I have to ask you. <laughs> And Jindal, whom you've referenced um, before I did, provides a pivot point to another theme that I think we should touch on because, you know, this is an age of, of rising seas and climate change and all of that stuff. And New Orleans is, as Sandy also revealed parts of New York to be, enormously vulnerable. Um, we have been cognizant, at least, and a little responsive to the threat posed in uh, New Orleans by seas and also importantly by the destruction of our wetlands by the oil industry, uh, uh, which Jindal, let's call him a friend rather than a prostitute before the oil industry, <laughs> but that's kind of the reality there. Um, the flag of Texaco flies over the <laughs> state of Louisiana. Right. Tell us a bit about the, you know, we've learned from Holland, we traveled to Holland to learn from the Dutch who do this a whole lot better than we do. Tell us about the environmental frontier that uh, Katrina obliged us to face? Well, um, 2.5 miles of 
wetlands lowers the storm surge by one foot. And we used to have the state of Delaware, more a, a land mass, a, a wetlands mass the size of Delaware below New Orleans that is now gone. So the, the threat of hurricanes is not just that they're getting bigger, it's that the, that which protected us naturally uh, after eons of uh, building up of natural levees and wetlands um, is being destroyed. We lose a football field every hour, they say. You, you hear different statistics. And my, my family's from down at the mouth of the river, and I've, I grew up there. And when I went back in the 80s, I think, and crossed the Empire Bridge and saw this expanse of water, which it used to take us, I think, 25 minutes by boat to get to Bay Adams, a big expanse of water. It was all bayous to you got. Now it's right there at the dock. It's really frightening. And uh, we, we, we need to address it. We need big bucks to address it. Uh, New Orleans is a very important port. Um, and uh, we aren't taking care of it. I think you should reference that. It's also uh, not often recognized, and this was pointed out to me by a number of people. This is not a local story. Yeah. Um, and there's a leading businessman in New Orleans who's involved in, in one of these, you know, Save the Wetland uh, uh, organizations. He said to me in an early interview, the worst thing that happened about Katrina is that it became about New Orleans because um, it, the port services the country and um, the statistics of how much, uh, you know, fuel, fuel fish, uh, uh, imports, all that stuff that comes through the port is enormous. And in fact, that organization, um, as he said, is taking the story up the Mississippi to Memphis and, and St. Louis and, and all the way up because um, it's not, the mouth of the river doesn't just belong to Louisiana. And uh, in Congress, I mean, well, you know, the comeuppance, of course, is Hestart, whatever is, however you pronounce this. Hestart. Hestart. Dennis Hestart. Yeah. Hestart. We need to have a. <laughs> if any of you are interested in the state of the coast of Louisiana, I encourage you to go to The Lens, which I co founded. It's our investigative news site, and we did a project with ProPublica, which maps the, and you can see a historical sort of slider of how much land loss there has been, what communities are being lost, and, and what called you losing expect ground, lose. so you can find it on our site. And what you expect to lose by 2045 mm -hmm. or something. Right. It's, it, it, it's frightening, but uh, you have these people in Congress who, when the money issue comes up for the wetlands and the Gulf Coast, it's like it's not their backyard. But it is, and um, even there was a, a congressman someone pointed out to me from Colorado, where they had the mudslides, the flood, you know, after the floods, and things slid right into a whole town disappeared. So he was one who voted against because you know it wasn't his territory. This is everybody's problem. It's not a local story. So that's one of the post-Katrina stories that is doesn't get heard enough is the uh, the national implications of of this story what are you learning from Holland? well um the dutch dialogues uh were um i i helped um sponsor these uh, we, they brought dutch water management experts to new orleans mm -hmm. to develop uh a pl plans and they developed superb plans which uh, they're not finding funding to implement. So um, the lovely irony about bringing the Dutch there is that in 1915, when, when uh, Albert Baldwin Wood developed the screw pump that drained the back swamp and made New Orleans possible, as we know it, um, the Dutch came over and said, we need you in, in Holland. Could you, would you come over? And he said, no, my work is here, but here are the plans to my screw pump. And that's how they drained the Zyder Z with the New Orleans pumps. The gist, the gist of, of, of I think Holland's lessons, insofar as I've grasped them, is that they have learned to live with water rather than trying to wall themselves off from it. 
you let the water in, you build your polders, you build your lakes and interior water retention areas, and then you have le so-called leaky levees. And there's a whole elaborate Dutch approach that we are beginning to pick up on. Our Bayou St. John has been reconnected to the lake that it feeds off of and so forth. But we're still fundamentally in the bar it, keep it away, and um, hope for the best. Uh, when, when the Dutch came over and were shown around New Orleans, uh, at the end of the day, they said, um, we have three questions. I think it's three. Uh, I, I hope I don't pay, uh, pay a, a Rick uh, <laughs> governor. Uh, um, why do you hide the water? Everyone wants to live around water. And you say the army is in charge of this? <laughs> now, what was the third? I don't remember that. But the, it the, was enough. The, 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 the also, the thing about living with water, I'm sure a lot of you have seen different plans because it's now really going across the country as well it should. It's one of those solutions for which there is no uh, downsides mm -hmm. because you come up with recreational areas. Uh, New Orleans is a perfect uh, uh, laboratory for this. We have canals. They're cemented. All you need to do is remove the cement, dig them a little deeper, make a recreational area on either sides of the canal, and you have what the Dutch have are beautiful landscaped areas that wind up uh, holding the water in a flood and keeping it, minimizing how it uh, you know, uh, injures the surrounding uh, neighborhoods. So it's like a double-edged sword in the best way. Um, the real issue, and it's classic in a lot of different things, it's very hard to turn around the ship. And you have a paradigm. I, I use the parallel in the book. Uh, the paradigm of highway building was very hard to turn around in terms of getting people to understand that it wasn't more highways that were ever going to solve our transportation or our congestion traffic uh, problems. A whole new sl slew of uh, solutions that started with streets and neighborhoods and uh, all those things that are now complete streets, all the and mass transit, all the things that are now mainstream. But that paradigm took decades to turn around. I'll never forget having a conversation with Jane Jacobs about this 20 some odd years ago, and she said, it's not gonna happen until the professors who teach transportation um, technique in colleges uh, retire and a new generation comes in because they were teaching and even to this day still teach some of the same things. So the paradigm in New Orleans is still heavily an engineering paradigm, which means, uh, and they're doing this now in some of the major, uh, the major streets are sort of boulevard-like streets. They're putting in bigger pipes to pump more water out in, on the very neutral grounds that could be redesigned to absorb the water um, in, in a really landscape way. And so this is the real challenge, even in the next decade, because the money that's going into the old engineering uh, methods could be diverted if uh, they wanted. But then you're dealing with contracts and agencies and jobs and unions and all those kind of things, and that's a hard nut to crack. Yeah, but I, you I could give contracts to do the work the right way to the same people who are doing it the wrong way. <laughs> I think there's a kind of, of conservatism that, that societies cling to. Um, not unlike you know, what David Callagher was telling me about right after the storm, the sense that we want to go back to what we had before or perhaps improve that without rethinking the paradigm. And one would think that after something as catastrophic as Katrina, that if ever you're going to rethink a paradigm, that would be the time. But it was. But part of the problem was FEMA would not fund anything unless it was putting it back the way it was. They would not fund anything that was done better. Mm -hmm. And this is the dumbest. Mm -hmm. Uh, gov government policy I ever heard of, and that it may be a private contractor who's doing it, but that's a government policy. Yeah. Only put back what you had. 
Yeah, there was some wiggle room achieved finally, and there was some, you know, incremental improvements were allowed, but Roberta's absolutely right. The Stafford Act forbids improvement. It's meant to be replacement only. And one measure of that, although the funding sources were different, is that our levy system, <laughs> which, uh, you know, collapsed, um, has been fortified to some extent. It's, they spent $14.5 billion on it, so there's something to show for that. But it has only been brought up to the standards that were not met in 1965 after Betsy. Um, we have a fortified uh, levy system against 100-year, so-called 100-year storms, which is a storm that happens once, has a 1% chance of happening in any, any year. It's not something that can't happen several times in a decade. The Katrina was, in fact, a 300-year storm, so we aren't even prepared to, re to rebuff a Katrina. By contrast, the Dutch, with their far more ingenious and sophisticated way of managing water, have fortified their coast against 10,000-year events, which is to say is a flood defense 100 times more robust than the one that is being finished up in New Orleans. This, you know, thanks, I guess, to uh, the president at the time, uh, but we wonder why his successor hasn't intervened, who said he would do whatever it takes to bring back the priceless city of New Orleans, and then gives us this jury-rigged uh, levy system that can't withstand the storm that just caused it to collapse. Um, the good news need for you New Yorkers is that the, uh, the New York and Connecticut apparently are stealing the Dutch water management experts from oh, really? Louisiana, and <laughs> they're, they're working up here, and I wish them well, but send them back when you're done, okay? We should um, invite questions in a formal way from anybody who wants to ask them. Uh, we're, we've been yakking ourselves here for quite a while. Who's, who's got a question? Dia, thank you. Oh, okay. I'll ask the question because I've got a microphone. Um, This is a challenge. Wait a minute. Post Katrina, New Orleans, best thing, not cost, worse loss. Who know? Who who wants to explain that question? <laughs> All right, we'll move on. Um, Okay, the people, this is an interesting one that I can at least understand. The people who left New Orleans and never came back, who are they? Where are they? Are they still of, of New Orleans? And do you, how do you define that loss? Um, Lois, why don't you speak about the diaspora, as we sometimes call it? One of the things I've heard is that most of the people who left the city after the flood have returned at least to the state. You still hear isolated stories of people who FEMA flew um, hither and yon who still have not been able to make it back. And there's some interesting, interesting reasons for that and implications of it. Harry Shearer, uh, the satirist and part-time New Orleans resident, always makes a point of saying that in the 2010 census, they didn't ask whether or not you were a Katrina evacuee unable to get back home. Well, just to say that the government flew these people everywhere and didn't particularly care what happened to them. Of course, there's some broad political implication of that because most of the folks who have flown out were black and inclined to vote Democratic, and by them not being there, it turns the state uh, at best purple and perhaps even, even red. Um, in terms of the implications, it gets back to your earlier question about culture because the great fear was that somehow the city would have lost its, its culture. Um, but the truth is that I don't, if you came to New Orleans now, there's still a whole lot of the things you would have gone to see and hear and taste uh, 15, 20 years ago. So in many ways, the loss of these people is felt acutely. Um, even in the, the, uh, the time right after the flood when we were importing people from all over uh, Central and indeed South America to come and rebuild the city at a time when New Orleanians were not being allowed to come back. The destruction of the public housing complexes that Roberto alluded to earlier was done in part as a means, I think, of ensuring, of minimizing the chance of these people coming back. Another aspect of the educational thing 
was that the assumption was that these people weren't coming back and therefore plans for the school system were made on the assumption that most New Orleanians wouldn't come back, but of course we had these kids drifting back, sometimes parentless because they preferred to be in New Orleans. So what I'd say is that we're a much smaller city now. Uh, the Great New Orleans Data Center says that about 20%, we're at 80% of our pre-flood population, but roughly 20% of those people are people who did not live in New Orleans before Katrina. We're busy trying to convert those people to become New Orleanians, and um, if we fail, we'll send them back to Brooklyn. <laughs> I, I think one also, um, I, I spent a lot of time in the book explaining the many, many different reasons that people didn't come back. Many of, the money, many of those reasons started out with inequities from day one. You could get more money from the government to not come back than to rebuild, and the money you could get from the government to rebuild was never enough unless you had a bank account uh, sufficient to begin with. So, um, plus there's a, something that's kind of, I think it's, if not unique, unusual for uh, New Orleans and others, not true in most cities. So many of the homes uh, lived in by uh, black, uh, low, middle, moderate income people were built by the families themselves. Uh, their father, their grandfather, never uh, created a deed, no line of succession. So comes Katrina, 13 siblings all have an interest in a property, not willing to turn it over to the last sibling who lived in it, no way to reclaim. So a lot of people- Nor did they have the paperwork to? And didn't have the paperwork, or um, as one person uh, points out in the book, it costs $6,000 just to hire somebody to try to find and create the paperwork. So under those circumstances, they found shelter elsewhere. They depended on their public hospital if they were elderly or not. Public hospital was the rock that so many people, Charity Hospital was the rock that so many people depended on. And their church, which if it wasn't reopened, they weren't coming back. So there are so many um, factors, including uh, the public housing one. Um, and one of the things that really blew my mind is while they weren't allowing back the very workers who would have been the workforce, and as one expert pointed out, he had suggested tent cities could have easily accommodated people quickly, like they do in disasters in foreign shores, um, but wouldn't entertain because it had to be a contract for all those formaldehyde uh, uh, FEMA trailers. But um, they sent they they distributed flyers at the uh, in the border of Texas looking for you know immigrants to come to to New Orleans that they wouldn't do for their own you know isol uh, distant diaspora so a lot of this is ugly um, but there are a lot of different reasons that people didn't come back or have not come back also um, in the Black middle class, the professionals, a lot of them were welcomed in other places, at other hospitals and other law firms and places where they were ha had uh, have trouble in New Orleans. So they found, uh, you know, better places to be. It's not an easy uh, answer to why people still have not come back, and some of them are still coming. I'd make one other point. The state administered program for helping people rebuild the road home had provisions to help um, homeowners, provisions to help owners of rental property, no provisions to help renters. The assumption by implication being that they had nothing worth replacing. I'll throw one number, throw one number out at you just to provide a little context. The Hispanic population in New Orleans, the people that uh, came in response to these recruitment drives at the border and and sometimes under less uh, well-oiled uh, kinds of, of uh, machinery has increased since Katrina by 80 percent. And it's a, it's a marvelous infusion culturally into our population, but there is a tough story um, behind it. Let me, let me ask an... I wanted to know the racial composition of the people that 
Well, the black population, I've got these numbers here. I, I, I tried to do my homework here. The black population, which was at about 67% before Katrina, is now at about 56%. So it remains majority black, um, fortunately. Um, well, the Hispanics, the Hispanics are a big part of it. A lot of the, a lot of, you know, the people that I speak of cavalierly as the young and the restless, these people who are coming into New Orleans to save us from ourselves and teach our kids and, and all of that, and have brought tremendous energy to the city. Don't, don't let my cynicism, um, you know, hold the day here. Um, there are black, middle class blacks among, in, in large numbers in that group. Um, there are whites, um, you know, the Hispanic, influx tends, I think, to be working class. We have, as you may know, a big, big Vietnamese population in New Orleans since resettlement after the, the war ended. So it's, it remains a very much a polyglot and marvelously complex uh, mix of ethnicities and, and races and, and so forth. What, uh, what in terms of growth in the population, does anyone, does anyone see any reliable figures about the other question is, uh, the housing projects were hope sixed. Uh, under the Clinton administration, there was a, uh, an elaborate mechanism set in motion to take public housing, which in many instances had fallen into disrepair or was troubling for whatever reason, tear it down, rebuild so-called mixed income communities where you had fully subsidized housing, you had semi-subsidized housing, you had market rate housing, and this was all to be done uh, consistent with Roberta's deeper analysis through public-private partnerships. Um, some of these new projects are terrific, but and the, the residents lucky enough to live in them are singing hallelujah, but the fact is a great many people were excluded from them because they began to impose uh, rules having to do with felon, if there's a felon in your family, the whole family got kicked out and that, that kind of thing. Um, so the numbers are very elusive. I, I'm not going to be able to pull one off my sheet of my crib sheet here. They're not, they don't keep track purposely. They there also were no numbers in the Hope Six project that was completed prior to the flood. Right. The they, they were holding off. Uh, they were keeping apartments empty. In fact, I keep, uh, I'm, I'm sort of on the alert waiting for the same kind of thing to happen in New York that happened down there. Because what happened in, uh, in New Orleans is part of a, uh, since Nixon, there has been a, a federal policy to get rid of and replace public housing with public-private partnerships, which is private developments with public funds integrated economically, but the percentage of public housing tenants that return to those mixed income projects varies from like 7% to 50%. But the, you know, it, or they get, and they get Section 8 vouchers to go elsewhere, many of whom uh, find themselves uh, trying to rent apartments with landlords who won't take Section 8, or from landlords who don't really care about upkeeping the prop property. It's a, a, an elusive number. They claim privacy is why they don't keep the numbers. <laughs> Very convenient claim. And some of us say, so just keep a record of the uh, zip codes. Where are they? What zip codes? Um, they claim to have some numbers. And who knows uh, if they're, th how many, viable, and, and, and what's true and what they're saying. The projects that have been rebuilt in New Orleans, uh, all, I, Many of my friends say, well, they look great because, first of all, they think that the, uh, the so-called neglected brick projects were hopeless, which they weren't. I go into great detail. They are fabulous, were fabulous, and were the model for garden apartments in suburbia when they were built in the 1940s. And they were solid and we'll built see. Built to last 300 years. Built to last at least... That I don't no. even. Uh, do you know? Is that number wrong? 
I thought I got that from you. Oh, I, <laughs> if you did, I don't remember it. <laughs> but they were, they're fabulous with, you know, tile roofs and uh, wood floors, all sorts of things. It's one of those um, sorry tales, but it's a cautionary tale. You know what really bothered me? Well, a lot of things bothered me about about that public housing. My mother lived three blocks from the Lafitte project, which was a gorgeous project. Um, but soon after Katrina, they took the roof fence off. It's like they, they these triangular um, things that were allowed air circulation in the attics, they took them off because they Invi we're inviting water in so that they have more reason to tear them down. This They're built with cypress. They were, they were gorgeous. This, was, this is a paralleled in the charity hospital story. I mean, it's, it's sabotage it yeah. is what it really was. And in the charity hospital story, which um, is a, a devastating story, but it, it, charity, the, the second oldest and considered one of the best public hospitals in the entire country, a great teaching hospital. It had it, everything about it was great. Wait, um, we're neglecting our we're neglecting our audience no, questions here. I'm sorry, but re, it, it's it's the same story where they actually after what after it was restored, patient ready, three weeks later, they sabotaged it. Let it making the faucets run and the sinks, clogging them up with sheets, doing everything to bring the water in and helping the building. Seek out the movie Big Charity, Big Charity, and read my book. You'll like. Uh, you'll, you'll like. I'd it. like to respond. Somebody asked about what happened to those who were displaced. Someone that was question. Yeah, I think we answered that. We, yeah. we worked on that one. I'm actually someone who was displaced by Hurricane Katrina because I am a low income person. I worked with an organization called the Katrina Rita Solidarity Coalition. And um, I just want to say that a lot of the reason that many of us have not been able to return or could not return was because of rents. There are no renters' rights organizations. There are no laws in New Orleans to protect tenants. So what happened was practically overnight, rents were quadrupled. When I finally was able to get back into the city and look for a replacement apartment because the one I was renting was not available due to damage, I was offered a kitchen floor in a one bedroom apartment shared with two men that I did not know for $800 a month, a kitchen floor. I also witnessed that people from the neighborhood where I live, their landlords had taken the entire contents of their house and put them out on the sidewalk, which does not leave people much to return to. So the answer to the question is of why people have not returned, it's classism. It's that the city of New Orleans is being rebuilt for people with money, not for low-income artists, not for low-income workers. And that's that's what keeps us out. I'm sorry, I just needed to say No, that. I'm glad you did. Um, we now have the answer to what happened to one person who left <laughs> after the, is the part of the diaspora. Well, and, and, and Roberta can tell you about many more and does so brilliantly uh, in the book. Um, good question here, um, and I'll preface it by telling the audience, if you're not aware of it, that we have jailed, let me think, a school board president with another school board president likely to follow in his wake, her wake, I should say. We are about to, we jailed a congressman. We have jailed Mayor Nagin. Um, and the question is, has Katrina helped to improve local government transparency? <laughs> and the, the particular uh, reference is, the land, is whether the Landrieu administration um, included here in parenthesis <laughs> as the current mayor uh, is the Landry administration. Um, you want to take it? You wanna well, we have um, the, len the Lens, which um, our editor publishers in the audience, as well as a couple board members, um, we have filed suit against the city of New Orleans recently for lack of fulfillment of public records, uh, specifically public records we seek deal with uh, city budget budgeting bill payment issues, the sort of check register, if you will. Um, the city 
uh, we I did ask for public records under the Nagan administration and was those were fulfilled I think more out of laziness than than any sense of duty under the Landro administration it is very very difficult for us to access pub public information runs a very uh, Anally retentive tight ship. <laughs> so I don't, I don't, I don't see a tremendous amount of improvement in transparency. Although the word has been adopted, um, I don't think the deed follows. So that's well, he's he's um, imitating our president, perhaps in in using the word and not mm -hmm. delivering. Much of our reporting relies on public records, so that's our our life's work at the lens. All right, let me, let me wrap up here, um, at least as regards the panel, and we're, of course, always open to further questions from the floor. Um, I happen to love the, the title of Roberta's book, We're Still Here, You Bastards. Um, it gets at, I think, the grassroots resilience that's a big part of, of all of this, um, also at the enormous challenges that we face, and we've heard a lot of pros and cons about New Orleans um, this evening. Um, glass half full, glass half empty. I want to put Roberta on the spot and ask her, okay, how are we doing? Are we better off? Are we worse off? Are we, what, 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 and I'll ask others as well to chime in. Well, it's interesting. In my last book, uh, which was published five years ago, The Battle for Gotham, New York and the uh, Shadow of Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs, I had a conclusion in which I said, um, those who want to think that the world is now all Jane Jacobs and no more Moses have to look twice. We still have Robert Moses projects, Atlantic Yards among them, uh, City Field among them, and we have a lot of Jane Jacobs. I found myself writing a similar conclusion to this book. We have a lot of positive things that have come out of Katrina, the lens being one of them, and a lot of the, uh, the, the local, uh, the grassroots, the neighborhoods that have been rebuilt. And the stories are quite wonderful, and pro certain projects, whether it's the edible schoolyard, um, and all sorts of things around the city, even f markets that weren't there before Katrina. And an engaged uh, public in many ways, mo certainly more than Katrina. And yet, we still have the Robert Moses urban renewal, destroy a neighborhood, destroy a project, just, you know, close the public hospitals, to destroy a hosp uh, uh, the public housing, um, you know, all the things that I, uh, that I related. So you still have both, but there's backsliding. And I, and I talk of their particular story in the, lower, in, in the Holy Cross neighborhood of the Lower Ninth Ward, um, that uh, is where the, the very engaged community opposed a totally inappropriate, overscaled, badly designed, wrong kind of project, and they were over, uh, they were ignored by a city council that really made the deals in the back room again. So there's backsliding on back room dealing not that there isn't in New York and a million other cities, but a process had evolved after Katrina that was much more respectful of public engagement. There's some backsliding and there's some going forward. There was a tax issue defeated um, that would have enriched some of organizations that didn't need enrichment and it was defeated through social media. and the social media opportunity in New Orleans is totally new since Katrina. So th it's not a, it's not a, a linear um, direction. Both things are happening. I, don't, I, I think it's an open question as to which direction will take the stronger route. Anyone else want to, anyone else want to uh, weigh in? How are we doing? As Ed Koch used to say, hmm. Lola's. One of the difficulties in answering that question is in trying to separate New Orleans from the national trends, both economically and culturally. So in addition to the fact that for the first several years after the flood, we're getting a lot of federal money, which meant there were more opportunities for jobs and that kind of thing. At this point, the national economy is improving. And our improvements in New Orleans, based on the brilliance of our current administration, are based on economic happenstance. So 
I'd like to state firmly that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody ever wants an argument for stimulus spending and its validity, New Orleans is it. We did not have the 2008 crash, just like it was somebody else's problem, because we were being effectively funded by by the feds, by coincidence, by happenstance, as, as Lolas puts it. Question here. I have a question. I moderated a panel in New York a couple of weeks ago about rebuilding at the city. And one of the leaders from the Lower East Side that was very much engaged in the rebuild by design and prevent by life, which I just say improved a great deal of the experiences the folks in New Orleans had, got up there at the very end and said, What I'm really worried about is that the success of our program may drive my neighbors out of the city. Yeah, gentrification. The idea of something you rebuilding and rebuilding it well to the point where it becomes a power to others may drive out the renters, may drive out the low income population. And I really want to find out whether this is becoming a trend in New Orleans, and what do you really do to protect uh, the fact that there's a lot of things that bubble up from the grassroots that really need to the kinds of innovative programs that Roberta always talks about. But then when we revisit these successes, they become failures because the people that built those successes are being pushed out. And I wonder, wonder if this is an issue in the long run. I think the answer very certainly is yes. Um, you know, it's the paradox of, of uh, you know, urban upgrades generally is that you have what an artist cadre in New York, in New York, you know, uh, the art world discovers Soho as it did 50, 60 years ago and event effectively turns it into suburbia and then moves on. And the neighborhoods become increasingly expensive as the sort of jackboot of fashion walks over them. We've seen that definitely in New Orleans. There's still, however, in New Orleans, a very long way to go. There are, there's a lot of neighborhoods that, uh, you know, would benefit from an infusion of money and new ideas and, and, uh, and then it would remain to be seen whether there was an effective protection in place for the, the original population that is being forced out. There is not uh, you know, there are nonprofits, there are philanthropic groups that certainly address that, those issues um, big time. There's community groups that spend a great amount of their energy on protecting against the ravages of gentrification. But it's not formally in any sense a government policy, so far as I know. And just let me j quickly add, I did try in the book, um, I, I make a distinction between just gentrification and displacement. Uh, gentrification has many positive sides to it. It's the displacement issue that is, is the real uh, problem. And there are solutions in varying forms, but the real missing element is the public commitment to those solutions because government would rather give tax incentives and all sorts of financial benef benefits to the large developers um, but not comparable advantages to the individual property owner, uh, whether it be a renter or uh, a, a resident owner. Uh, and this is a challenge. There are solutions, but again, it's um, the funding goes only to the top. We're being nudged off the stage and out of the room. Those of you who want to hear more from Roberta are going to have to buy her book and chat with her as she signs it for you. Um, there is time for that to happen. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> thanks, thanks to the panel for being very patient uh, with their moderator. And um, have a good evening.